Oh, I see it now. I see it totally. Okay. I'm putting you up. I'm going to share it to my page. Oh, I see it now. I see it totally. So we are now live. Oh, the joys of technology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Conscious Cafe. I'm Helen Bello, the director of Welcome Home Toronto to a Body, Mind, Spirit Connection. And Welcome Home is an experiential philosophy dedicated to the global spiritual oneness, uh, this timeless truth of oneness. It is a destination experience now online, and it's promoting community, connection, oneness, and the embodiment of the truth of who we are through meditation classes, um, other special events, and our Conscious Cafe, which will support you to grow consciously in the direction of the life you desire to live. With me tonight, as many of you know, and for those of you who don't know, is Dr. James Mellon. He is the founding spiritual director of the Global Truth Center located in Los Angeles. He is also the co-founder of Welcome Home uh, Los Angeles. He is also my mentor, my teacher, my friend, my business partner in Welcome Home. And James's philosophy of life is enlightenment through entertainment. He wears many hats in the entertainment world from being a Broadway actor, director, writer, producer. He is a sought after speaker uh, in personal growth. He is also the author of a book called Mental Muscle, 16 Weeks of a Spiritual Boot Camp. It is a fabulous course to take with James and has a new book coming out called The Five Questions. Some of you may be familiar with The Five Questions if you've taken meditation class with me at Welcome Home Toronto or at Welcome Home LA. And if you're not, you are in for a treat to really uh, let these questions uh, surround you and be within you to see what answers you come up for yourself with. And so, James, thank you so much for being on this Conscious Cafe. Welcome oh, to the my, Toronto crowd. <laughs> my pleasure. And I so, so, you know, you gave me such a, a beautiful intro. I feel like I need to give you as equally an amazing intro because um, I think I learn as much from you as you learn from me. And I am so in awe of who you are and how you have just taken over this beautiful space in Toronto and explored it opening. So uh, I'm excited to be here and I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever questions you give me. <laughs> well, I think it would be a really great place to start and thank you for that. Um, introduction and and kind <laughs> words from you uh it's it and i i'm just going to push that back right at you and say it is because of your brilliant idea and you presenting it to me and i think this this falls into the five questions what wants to know me and you know yeah. come through me and uh it landed so clearly and deliberately that i couldn't help but say yes and so why don't you start by telling us how did the five questions come about? Well, um, I was doing a workshop. I was uh, about to lead a workshop. And since you know me so well, um, I, I have so many things going on at the same time that I arrived at Casa de Maria for a practitioner retreat. And the first workshop was mine to give. And uh, Reverend Nancy, one of my assistant ministers, turned to me and said, so what's the first workshop? What's the first workshop we're doing? And I went, what? And she said, you're the first workshop. I went, oh my God, I totally forgot. I don't know what the first workshop is. And she said, well, you've got about an hour, figure it out. And so I went and found a tree on the uh, grounds of Casa de Maria up in Santa Barbara or Montecito. And I sat under the tree and I just, 
closed my eyes and just started thinking, what do I, what, you know, what, 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 what do I need to do here? And all of a sudden, these five questions in a row just uploaded through me. You know, people say download. I always say uploaded through me because it's, it's in me, but it needed to come up. And I had my little book with me and I, and I just wrote, I was, I just wrote the first question, which is why am I here? Why am I here? And I think I started with that question and just said, all right, why am I here? And not just why am I at Casa de Maria, but why am I here? Why am I about to teach a workshop that I hadn't planned? Why am I here in this point in my life when I thought I'd actually be a huge movie star? Why am I sitting under a tree figuring out what am I doing next? Um, it was a big, why am I here? And then the other four questions just came in a row and I have not changed them, nor have I changed their order. And uh, once they came through me, I, the tears started to pour out of me and I was like, well, clearly this is my workshop. And I walked in with 30 people sitting there and took, brought them through the workshop and people were laying on the floor and crying. And it, it just was, it was so beautiful. And I then took it with me to uh, Las Vegas for a workshop I was teaching there. And they all, and everybody was like, when's the book coming out? I was like, uh, I just came up with the questions. I don't know what the book would be. <laughs> so that, that's how it began. Well, I like what you said about when you recognize the question in the question, why am I here? And I thought, I thought I would be by now a movie star. And I, I think many of us have this idea that we are going to be something and that that is going to uh, have us make our mark in the world. And often that, it, I know many people have thought they would be at a certain place in their life or have something that would define them and they're not living that. Yeah. And so when you look at the question, why am I here? What, what's underneath that for you? Cause I think it's bigger than just what you're going to do. Oh, oh, so much bigger. And in fact, Helen, why am I here brings me to the understanding that I am not here to make my mark. I am not here to, to change the world. I'm not here to, to make a name for myself. Boy, for somebody, for an A personality like me that, that grew up, I just want to star in a Broadway show. And as soon as I starred in a Broadway show, I was like, ah, okay, now what's next? It was just always, what's the next thing? And the why am I here takes me finally to what's underneath it all. It's, as Thomas Troward, the great, teacher would say, I'm here to enjoy life. I am here to enjoy this thing called living. And if I do that properly, everything else gets answered. Yeah. And I think that idea of enjoying living opens, I know for me, it opens me up to, like you said, uploading ideas and possibilities that my conditioning through my patterned personality, through what I learned growing up, um, through what I thought was supposed to be uh, who I am, mm -hmm. uh, it, it allows me to show up in such an expansive way. And I would say as, as I look at my life and all the different things that I did, have done, like. I wouldn't have imagined those had I not no. been open. Yes, there are people now that see me. We, you know, I, uh, one of the shows I did on Broadway was West Side Story, and we just had a 40 year reunion. 40, that was 40 years ago. I still feel like I could get up and do it. Well, sometimes. But 40 years ago, you know, I starred on, on Broadway and West Side Story, and here we are 40 years later, and everyone that came to the reunion, and most of the cast came. I threw it here at my house. Facebook. Yes. Yes, right? Uh, but every one of them was like, you are the least person we ever thought would be a minister. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that just tells you a little bit about myself back then. But um, yeah, we don't know. I, I don't know what's the best use of me. I know that there's something in me that does know. But when I say, why am I here? Mostly now, it's never about the past. It's always about why am I here? Why am I here today on this 
you know, uh, live cast with Helen Vallow, why am I here? And that's what I want to know. Why am I here now? Why am I here now? And why am I here now? You know, that, that's where that question takes me for the most part now. I love that. I love it because it, it just, for me, it allows that sense of there's a creative energy that just, just wants to create and whatever that yeah. is and to be present to it and allow it to create through me. And, you know, that, that creation always for me brings a sense of lightness and joy, which mm -hmm. like when you refer back to Troward, our purpose to be here is to really enjoy life. Right. Exactly. Now I will tell you, and I want to tell everybody that, that watches this, that, you know, the book, the book is a few months away, but it's very close to being finished. And, um, when I finished writing the book, which I actually finished it over a year ago, uh, it went to publishers and it went to some people to read and everybody got back to me with the same answer, which was that they wanted the questions to be inter to, to be intertwined with my life. They wanted to Remember see that. How, yeah, how the questions, how they relate to my living. And, you know, and I was, I really balked at that. I was like, you know, I'm not trying to write the four agreements. I'm not, I'm not trying to write anything. I just want to write what I want to write. And I, I want it to be in my own kind of voice. And then I gave it to my daughter, Nora, to read. And when she came back with the exact same thing, I literally, I was just like, unbelievable. Because I figured I'm going to give it to someone who I'd like to read it, like a younger person who's not entrenched in metaphysics, uh, although she grew up in it. And she said, you know, Dad, I love this. I lo she, she said, I love both books that you wrote. I said, oh, you mean Mental Muscle in this? She no, Dad, you've written two books here. You wrote one book about your life and another book about these questions, and I think they should go together. And I was like, oh, my God. So I knew I was going to have to rewrite it. And, and it's kind of hard to take it and now try to mix it together. And then my beautiful girl was in a car accident and died. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I'm sure will define my life from that exact moment on. And it was a year later, it was in August, a year later, well, nine months later, I was on, uh, on the, a boat, a houseboat, same houseboat I was on the year before when I finished the book. And I finally decided what I needed to do was take the five questions. And it never even occurred to me. My number, oh, here it is right here. The number five. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That tattoo's there because that was my number with Nora. I would give her five kisses every night before she went to bed. And that became our thing, the five kisses. And then I had the five questions. But I still never put the two together. Then it occurred to me that it took Nora five days from the time of her accident on Sunday until Thursday when she passed. So it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. She gave me five days to deal with this so that I could, I could somehow deal with this. Huh? Getting very emotional. And so what I've decided to do is take the five questions. I've kept everything that I wrote and I've added my journey during those five days. Because wow. I know that the, the very first moment when I got the phone call that she'd been in an accident, my first question is, why am I here? What is, what, why am I here? What do I, what's going on? What, what do I need to know here? What's coming up? Why am I here? Um, so, and, but the book is still, it still has humor in it, but it does chronicle those five days. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the way to do it because suddenly not only do I give you the five questions, but I show you how I use them. That for me is not only profoundly touching, James, but it's, it's, it's just such an incredible example of how you are able to work with and, and be with one of the most tragic things that anybody as a parent could ever experience the loss of a child and yet instead of getting my my latest catchphrase is sucked into the undertow of grief 
and staying as a victim to the grief. Mm-hmm. It's not like you will, you'll feel that grief, but it's, it's that you are able to take that and put it into a context of there's a deeper meaning for every single thing that happens for us in our life, no matter mm-hmm. how tragic it is. And most people want to run from it. Or they want to fix it. Or they want to, they want to fix it or they want to, they want to have a veneer over it. So that well, they I can, feel yeah, it. totally. Yeah. I can tell you that um, when I was told what was really going on hours later in the, in the uh, emergency room, uh, I wanted to fix it. I, I, I knew I had to fix it. I had to fix her. I had to fix this situation. And, and um, you know, quickly got to the second question, which is, uh, what wants to know me? Mm-hmm. And uh, people have a problem with that question. They're like, what wants to know me? What's, what, you mean a person? What? It's like, no, we live in an energetic field of creativity. And there are ideas, like Elizabeth Gilbert in her beautiful book, Big Magic, she talks about it. There are ideas everywhere. What ideas? And for me at that moment, it was more like, okay, what wants to know me? What wants to help me out of this? What wants to bring me away from, as you just said, this this dark tunnel that's about to suck me into it? What wants to know me at a higher level? What wants to take me to a higher understanding of this? How can I stand here in this, in the midst of this horror and be a beacon of light, which is what I chose to do. Um, And it saved me. It absolutely saved me. Mm -hmm. I think that's when we're we're really (laughs) in the dark night of the soul and down on our knees saying, okay, I come fully and completely surrender. What is it? What is it? And I love that question. What is it then that wants to know me in my deepest, darkest place? Right. Or what wants to know me in everyday struggle as well. I mean, there isn't anybody who doesn't, isn't struggling with something. I mean, there are a number of people struggling with the self-isolation and, or the uncertainty. Oh, God, yes. And it's like, okay, but what wants to know me? And you know what? It's our philosophy to the understanding that if I believe, and I do, that life is always unfolding perfectly, no matter what, and if I believe that, that, that God is really this creative divine energy of love that is always moving me forward in a highest and best, then I damn well better ask the question, what wants to know me? Because what's going to want to know me is the highest, is the best, is the most loving, is the most comforting, is the most enlightening. So when I say what wants to know me, I'm like, get my mind out of this, get my reactionary mind that is that is that is dealing with the relative facts tell me something better tell me something higher tell me tell me why you know answers want to know me wisdom wants to know me love wants to know me and that's probably one of the most liberating journeys we can take is, yes is, isn't it you know because that's what liberates us from the world of form the world of the relative of all the the collective fear and angst or the ideas, the ideas that somehow you're supposed to suffer for the rest of your life because of what you went through. Mm. You're not here to suffer. Do we feel the pain? Absolutely. Does, is there probably always that pain? Yes, but it doesn't define who you are. No, and I love when Ernest Holmes says, he says, we have learned everything we could possibly learn through suffering. Yes. So I'm like, well, I am suffering. I don't need to learn about suffering. I know what suffering is. I had stage four cancer 10 years ago. I know what suffering is. I lost a mother at 18, at 19. I know what suffering is. I lost countless best friends to AIDS just mm-hmm. through that whole first 10 years of the age crisis. I know what suffering is. And I have learned a lot. And I would like to believe Ernest Holmes when he says, okay, you've learned everything you need to learn through suffering. Then, of course, when this happened, it was like I'd never experienced suffering ever in my entire life, not, not compared to this. Mm-hmm. And yet, there's more to know, isn't there? There's 
always more to know if we're willing to open it up. Yep. Open up to it. But that leads to the third question. The third question, which is, what wants me to release it? What Ooh. do I need to get the hell out of me? Right? And I, always, I love that question. What wants me to release it? And you know, the funny part about that question is, I'm sure if I asked you, which I won't, if you, if you were like, okay, what could I let go of that, that I really have no more, no more need of in my life? Um, something comes up every time I ask it of myself. I'm every like, oh, yeah, I, can get, I can get rid of that now. Um, but ultimately, in a loving way, things that want me to release it is because I have taken something. All energy is nothing but love. I have taken some loving energy and morphed it into something that is not loving. That, that somehow does not work with me. But if I release it, it goes back to its loving, creative, energetic state and can be used for good. There's, there's crap inside of me that if I were just to release it, I could put that beautiful, beautiful good at back out, out, out in the world. What was the first question? Did you see that? Yes, I did. And that was from, from Lena. Lena. And it's- Hi, Lena. <laughs> It is, why am I here? Why am I here? And then the second question is, what wants to know me? And now, what wants me to release it? You know, yes. the funny thing is, is and, and this has come through a lot of, of doing the meditations in the mornings with people, yeah. and um, the, especially the spirit breath meditation, which is threaded through a number of the meditations. Yeah. And I talk about the inspiration is the breathing in and moving the energy of spirit through our bodies. The expiration is something that's expired in us. We no yeah. longer need it. It no longer needs to define who we are. It no longer needs to be that, that niggly thought that's, that's keeping us limited. So it's expired. And you expire it with a blessing and mm -hmm. say, thank you, thank you. At some point, that probably served us in some way, that, that belief. <laughs> but we're done. We're done. I don't, I don't need it anymore. Yep. And so I love that. What wants, to re wants me to release it. What wants me to release it, yeah. It and sometimes it's, it's big. Sometimes it's, mm -hmm. it's some addiction you're not even aware you have. I mean, there are people, there, there's an addiction for every single thing we do. <laughs> mm -hmm. We can take anything. I mean, I think pretty soon it'll be like, hi, I'm a Netflix addictor. I'm addicted to Netflix. And everybody's like, hi, welcome. We are too. So, yeah, I think there'll be a lot of us in that one. <laughs> <laughs> after this coronavirus. Netflix yes, Anonymous. <laughs> yes, N-A. No, that's not Codex Anonymous. Um, Next day. But, but, yeah, but, but sometimes it's big that what, you know what? Here's one that I would love everybody to release. You know, what wants me to release it? My victimhood. Mm -hmm. Victim mentality. Get rid of it. It does nothing for me. You know, if I, if I, if I hold on to being a victim, I'm going to have to find perpetrators. I can't be a victim without a perpetrator. So basically, if I'm going to be a victim, I'm putting an all-out bulletin to everybody who needs to perpetrate. Here I am. I need to perpetrators to be a victim. So I need, you know, and I, I understand that, you know, and I work with people all the time, get rid of that need to be a victim. You know, that's what wants you to release it, put it back in the world where it becomes a creative energy. Mm -hmm. And I think it shows up, being a victim shows up in so many uh, nuances that we don't realize all the different facets of victimness. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, and I've had this experience in my, in my own life in the last couple of weeks of really getting clear about saying no to someone else's self-serving subconscious needs and behaviors. And that if I allow that to continue in my life, then I am making myself a victim. I am fully mm -hmm. responsible for that. And so to be able to say no to that and, and recognize it. And it's, it sometimes takes a little bit of digging. Oh yeah, totally. And I, I, um, I have someone I work with who <laughs> usually right as in the, in the middle of this person telling me their story, they will stop and go, this is me being a victim, isn't it? I'm like, yep, it is. 
and it's just amazing. We, once we're aware of it, we start to see it everywhere we go. We're like, oh my God, I'm just being a victim here. You could be driving down the freeway and you're screaming at somebody for doing what they did and you're like, I'm being a victim to their driving. Yeah. And yet they're not even hearing me. They don't hear me screaming at them. I'm just doing all this to myself. So let it go. Yeah. Yes. I what, love what? Eleanor Roosevelt's um, quote, no one can make you feel inferior without your uh, consent. And no it's one like, can make you feel anything, anything. without you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. And so it's it, that question, what am I consenting to here? <laughs> like, I'll yes. inspire that. Mm -hmm. And I love, uh, one of the things I use all the time in my workshops is, what am I thinking? Do I want to live the results of my thinking? Mm -hmm. What can I think instead? Yeah. Easy, one, two, three. What am I thinking? Do I want to live the results of this thinking? What can I think instead? So easy. It is. Maybe so that's my next book. I know, I was easy, just thinking easy, that. <laughs> easy is one, two, three. Yes, there you go. There you go. I gotta, I gotta finish this one first. My husband's always saying, you have the next 10 ideas before you finish this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish this one first. I understand that one. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Oh, I'm on to so many ideas. Okay, gotta do this first. Yes. Mm. So, which actually brings us to the fourth question. Yes, which is, what is mine to do? And, and, and I'm, I'm really pinpointing this one. What is mine to do right now? Mm. Not what's mine to do in the world, what's, mine go, what, what's my big plan? It's just, what is mine to do right here? And, um, you know, in the book, we come to a point where we have to, ugh, it's harder to talk about than I thought, uh, we have to decide what is what are we going to do because it's very clear that Nora is never coming back. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was right when that question came up for me. It was like, okay, what is mine to do? Because there was there were everyone was not in agreement, and um, so I just really listened, and I could almost hear Nora inside of me just saying, dad, come on, you know what to do. And, um, and I think when we ask ourselves that question, honestly, what is, what is mine to do right here? What is mine to do right now? Or even just what is mine to do in this situation? What is mine to do in this situation? I think there will always be that voice of whatever, whoever your Nora is inside of you, or just your own intuitive nature that says, come on you know what to do it's like when um when we were putting her memorial service together and everybody was asking who did i want to run it and i said me i said i'm gonna run it and they went you can't possibly do that there's no way you'll get through that and i went no i have to run it because we, nora and i used to have that joke and i believe you know this joke because you were at the yeah service you saw the service but she used to we always have this joke about me marrying her and i'd always be like honey i can't marry you i would be i'd cry through the whole thing i'd ruin your whole wedding i'd be standing up there i couldn't get the words out i said no and she went dad you're gonna marry me you're just gonna have to grow a pair and do it and as soon as everybody was asking who's gonna run her service i was like all i kept hearing was uh you better grow a pair and do it yourself because no one's gonna do it like you're gonna do it and so i did so you know, what, what is mine to do? It's a big question, but with a very simple answer most all the time, really, if you're willing to listen to that voice. Yeah, and, and to really, you know, I honor you for listening to that voice because otherwise you would have had so many regrets, right? You would have been sitting there going, yeah, but what, I'm that, no, yes. I could have never sat through it no. if it wasn't me up there. But here's That's the what other I've come thing. To know. Yeah. It takes such courage to listen to that voice and, and do it because mm. there are so many beliefs and so many um, family traditions, cultural traditions, religious traditions, uh, societal traditions, or beliefs that. You're supposed to do something a certain way. Right. <laughs> and it's like, 
where does that come from? It, it, it's, just, it's just an idea that was taken on as truth, but it might not be your truth. Right. Well, and you and I, let's face it, you and I are not those people <laughs> that believe there's only one way to do something oh. or that we should follow the tried and true. My normal reaction is, how's this supposed to be done? Good. Here's how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but, but like I said, I really could not have sat there and just watched everybody else talk about Nora. I, I, I needed to, 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 to finalize that myself to, 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 and to honor who she was, you know, to really honor it. Well, so. and uh, you know, how you and Will and Kevin and mm -hmm. Nora's mom, um, honored her. I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, and was, Kevin, Kevin was very, when everybody else was saying, James, you shouldn't do this. He looked at me and he went, I think you're right. He, he, he was, and so was Will. Mm -hmm. Cause, cause, cause people were like, don't make Will speak. And I said, Will, it's up to you. And he was like, dad, of course I'm going to speak. And I mean, it would be, it would be totally acceptable if the three of us just sat there shattered and, and just let it go on. That's, that's, that, that would be totally respectful mm -hmm. and everybody would understand that, but it wouldn't feel good to in any of us. Well, I think it's also such a beautiful example of you stepping up and, and, and expressing what was in your hearts, all three of you. And, mm -hmm. you know, that idea of, oh, you can't let Will speak. I mean, again, that is some, um, some idea that comes from somewhere else, but it doesn't come from within you. And it certainly didn't come from within Will. And what I, you know, that idea of what is mine to do right now, no matter yes. what anybody else says, does, or think, can we have the conviction that I know that I know that I know this is mine to do? Right, right. This and is my, yes. In. And that, that's something we can inspire the world to, to understand that, 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 the, the, that which is theirs to do is right there, right in front of them. They just have to get everything else out of the way but what you know what, what wants me to release it you know what wants to know me all of these questions line up so that you get to what is mine to do right now and then you get to the final question and this is the question question five is the one that you know uh, it can be taken the wrong way and and yet it, when you line these up why am i here what wants to know me what needs me to release it what is mine to do right now? And then the final question that puts it all together, which is, do I know how great I am? Do I know how great I am? Not ego, not a big inflated ego. Oh, I'm so great. No, it's, do I know the power that I have within me? Do I know that I am this, this incredible energy of life? As, as Rumi says, do I know that I am the entire ocean in a drop? Because if I do, every one of those questions makes perfect sense. I do know what's mine to do. I do know what I need to release. I do know what wants to know me and I let it know me. And I know why I'm here. Mm -hmm. So when you back them up that way, you get it. I know how great Nora was too. You know, and, and when I got to that, I also want to tell you this, Helen, you know, you're the first person I've sat and talked to about this, certainly in public. I haven't talked to anyone about this, which is why it's taken me so long to finish this book. Um, but I'm ready. Obviously, I said yes, so I'm ready. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got to Do I Know How Great I Am uh, at the hospital, it was the last day, and um, I was holding her hand, and it wasn't about me. It was like, do you know how great this young woman is? Yes, she only had 19 years, but oh my God, what she did in those 19 years, what she has left me with, what she's left anyone who knew her with, um, and, the, and the things she's written that will be left for, you know, I'm sure I'm going to use a lot of what she's written, a lot of her songs. Um, 
I did know how great she was. I expected an incredible life from her. I expected this <clears throat> amazing career for her. We all do for our children. I expected such, I expected, you know, this, this, this world to just be at her feet based on all the talent she had. And in that moment, sitting there with really a, a, just what was just a body really, because I knew she was already gone. Um, although she was right there with us, but I had to come to terms and this is what we all need to come to terms with. I believe I am not great because of the things I do. I am great. She was great lying there, right there, prepared to leave, prepared to let go of her body. That's greatness also. Mm -hmm. So getting a better understanding of, do I know how great I am? Because if I do, it's not tied to anything, just to the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is total surrender. Yeah. That is total surrender into that that truth of who we all are, right? Are we willing to actually go there? And, you know, I, I, this is a profoundly intimate conversation, James, that I am so honored to hold the space for. And I think that your, your questions and, and especially, do I know how great I am? It, it then allows for you, for me, for anyone to come back into that place of, am I, am I really, really, honestly, consciously living the life I am meant to live? Mm -hmm. Am I living this greatness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I playing small? Yeah. And that's why we're here. I th that's, you know, I mean, it's one of the things that I love about this philosophy, that I love about the people that come to Welcome Home, Global Truth Center. It's to, do you see how great you are? Because I see it in people. I see how just t incredibly talented, loving, expansive, um, accomplished in their own beingness and expressing that love in the world. And for me, that doesn't get any better. Like, no, I agree. Thank you. I'm complete. I, I, I am complete in that. Well, that's why our, our vision statement is love only, forgive everything, but the piece de resistance is yes. remember who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, remember who you are. And if you can remember who you are in the face of everything, then, you know, I remember 10 years ago when they told me I had stage four cancer and I was like, that doesn't, com that, that does not make sense at all. And uh, I just spent the entire healing process remembering who I was and being very clear about it. You remember, I refused to let my hair fall off my head. Yes. I mean, that truly was more about ego. But I was ego. Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe not, <laughs> because maybe you were also not buying into a collective yes. belief that this is the way it has to happen for you. Yes. I also know that, I also thought I didn't have a pretty head. I didn't like the shape of my head without hair on it. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but I did. I was like, no, just because you're telling me everybody else loses their hair doesn't mean I will lose my hair. Mm -hmm. Although I did have to laugh because the nurse at one point, my doctor once said to me, because she called me her miracle patient. She was like, no one goes through this without losing their hair and you've kept all that beautiful hair. And she said, but you know what? You might have actually not gotten, not bought into the nausea. And I looked at her and she went, yeah, you know, I told you that everybody gets sick from this and so you did. You didn't fight that one. And I thought about it. I went, oh my God, she's right. I just assumed that as soon as the chemo hit me, I'd be sick. And boy, was I sick. So it really is about, do I know how great I am? I'm so great, I cannot lose my hair. And I'm also so great that I can buy into the nausea and lose my guts. So. And that's, that's, 
that's both ways, right? Yes. Do totally. I know how great I am that I can attract all this crap into my yes. life? Yes. Oh, and I can like, make a mess out of things. Oh, can't well, you? Pardon me? I said, can't you make a mess out of things if you want to? <laughs> I used to. You me know too. What? No more. I don't anymore. I'm not into it. I don't want messes yeah. in my life. I am very clear. I want to live my life in wholeness, integrity, and love. And I, the rest, not interested. And, and apparently, um, you've also decided to live your life with a portrait in the attic because you don't seem to age. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had people tell me, I, um, I had a couple of coaching clients that I hadn't seen in a long time. And this one woman said to me last week, she goes, you, you keep getting younger. She goes, it must be all that spiritual stuff you do. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed. I said, it, yeah, that's it. But you know what? It's also, it is. what is your consciousness around aging? And my poor husband, because he has to listen to me say, no, nope, I don't buy into that. No, nope, that's not happening to me. Yeah. No. Nope. And it doesn't. I'm good. Yesterday we were doing, I was doing a workout on my porch, which you're kind of looking at. My weights are right underneath me. And um, I had someone here working through things with me. And I was watching this guy and he's, he's half of my age. And he dove onto the ground, went into a head, handstand, kicked his feet up, landed on his feet, and then went into a push up. And I was like, I'll try that. He was like, what? I said, no, I want to try that. He said, oh, uh, you know, you're 65. I don't see you diving onto your hands and doing a push-up, or doing a, a kick, handstand kick off. And, and I went, I'm going to try it. So I jumped onto my hands and collapsed. Just <laughs> fell over. Um, I tried technique I, to that. <laughs> I tried to kick, and that's what I said. I said, that's not because I'm old. That's because I don't know how to do it. I said, Correct. but as we work this out, I will know how to do this. To which Kevin turned around. He was doing something. He said to me, he said, James, I have no doubt that you could do that. The question I have for you is, why? <laughs> it's very funny. You hear Kevin saying that. But it's yes. true. Once you learn the technique, you could do it. Yes. You want to do yeah. it. Yeah. I don't buy into age at all. <laughs> no. I mean, hey, look at all look that at you us. are creating. At, yeah, at oh yeah. Five, right? Because Welcome Home LA is launching fully. As soon now as we were allowed back out. As soon as we're back out. Welcome Home launched fully and was just on the precipice of exploding. And now is is actually, you know, it's quite interesting. There's still so much activity and, and things happening for Welcome Home that I could not have imagined, and I'm, I'm announcing something on Sunday at Sunday service, so anybody who's Ooh, listening. Um, good. But just what Welcome Home has attracted here in Toronto in terms of support, interesting, dynamic people, um, the, the, the kind of experiences that were happening, it's like much bigger than I ever could have imagined. And yet, it's like when there's a vision and you know that that vision is great and you let it, you open it up and let it go. Yep. It's like, oh, I said to somebody, oh my gosh, it's magical. And then they said, no, <laughs> it's divine. <laughs> it's logical. It it's is logical. It's virtually logical, yes. Mm. It is. So again, you know, coming back to those questions, I love how you put them into a meditation. We were doing it every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. I think I'll switch it to Saturdays now. I was doing Aging with Power on Saturdays. Oh, I which, love Aging with Power. Oh my gosh, such a brilliant meditation. Um, but we have our, our sound bath at now on uh, Thursday mornings. So. Oh, that's great. Yes. Do you know what I love? One of my, my favorite class, I do it every day by myself, but um, I think I'm going to start putting it, giving it as a gift to the community while we're all. I love um, uh, the authenticity of dance. 
dance your authentic self. I, every morning around, right after spirit breath meditation, you can find me in this room looking like just like this disco bunny from the 70s. I have my whole playlist of songs and just as just about the time Diana Ross starts singing I'm Coming Out, I am like diving up and down and I have all my dance moves. I just love it. Yeah, it's a fantastic class. Yeah, I, it just you gives know, people the opportunity to just let yeah, loose. let go. Yeah, let go. Yeah. You know, it's all about letting that energy flow. And I think that's one of the things that I appreciate so much about the classes at Welcome Home is that they are, there's an energetic movement that happens, not just in your mind, not just in your heart, yes, in your body. And well, it's an experiential philosophy. Yes. Experiential. You get to live it. Mm-hmm. And then you take all that energy that you felt and you start creating your life from it. And it's, it's amazing what happens. I think that's why I'm looking younger. It's because I'm doing all those meditation classes. <laughs> well, it is too. Somebody said to me the other day, I was teaching a class and they said, did you get a facial or something? I was like, no, I did not get, yeah, I went and got a facial in the middle of the pandemic. No, I did not get a facial, but it is true. It's just like, yeah. I guess we're all putting portraits in attics now. That's it. That's <laughs> it. So can you tell me, can you, you have any kind of timeline of when you'd like to finish the book and release it? Actually, um, I'm, to I'm toying. I, 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 there's two different dates for me. Either I want to release it on August 20th, which is Nora's birthday. Mm -hmm. or perhaps if I'm still not done, if I don't feel that it's exactly what I want, um, maybe November 25th, which is the day of her departure. So either her birth date or her exit date. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of those two dates, I'm, I'm leaning towards, I, I feel so moved by what this has turned into that it could very well be August. August 20th would be the date that I launch it but I also have publishers and I have an agent that that is shopping wants to shop it so mm -hmm. it also has some but I might put it out myself on her birthday just as a soft launch while we're seeing where, where it's going to go well it would be great if you could bring it to Toronto for the grand opening when we have that in the fall sometime oh let, let's let's plan that mm -hmm. yes yeah nice book signing yes mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be beautiful. Tribute to Nora as well. It should be yeah, I'm probably going to use this five. Oh, I realized I did it upside down to you, didn't I? Did you see the five? Oh, mm -hmm. it does. Right well, too. I've seen the five, but I don't yeah. know if other people... I might use that five, her five, as... Um, you can't really see it. It kind of goes... Wait, I'm going to, just, I'm going to show you this way. Mm -hmm. Perfectly? Yep, can see it yeah. perfectly. So that's, um, I might use her five as the book cover. Beautiful. Because she That'd designed be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I thank you for such an intimate conversation, an authentic conversation, James. I feel deeply honored to have you share your experience and feelings with us at this time. and. Um, I look forward to when the book comes out. I look forward to when we get to cross borders and <laughs> do exchanges again, and as well as um, have you and Eric come up for a grand opening and for me to go to LA for the grand opening of Welcome Home Los Angeles. Los Angeles, yes. Yes. And then it's just Welcome Home everywhere. Yes. That's, like I said, this is bigger than both of us. It's, quite amazing so and what an incredible opportunity for people to really be able to experience the philosophy but also touch into something that is so um so powerful within themselves and to take mm -hmm. that that energy that power that creative force within each of them out into the world, because that's what makes the world a better place. And yeah, I, think I think, 
I agree, I agree with you because I, the five questions is meant to be a book for people to use to tap into their own innate wisdom. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody what to think. I'm just giving them the opportunity to think and to allow and to tap into something in them. I'm happy to tell my story, but then it's about what story are you going to tell? Yeah. 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 And everyone, I believe, has a story of transformation um, within them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So what a gift to the world. Thank you. What a gift you are, Helen. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank your picture, your your the design of your sh- picture right now with that beautiful light right above your head and those gorgeous flowers there. It's like you are such a brilliant designer as well. Oh, yes, I know. I, I put I drive people a little bit crazy at Welcome Home. <laughs> I'm like, okay, now we need this, and it's got to look this way, and it's got to feel okay. a certain way. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, and my cat yep. has well, chewed the tulips. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're her morning snack. Which is That's funny. funny. Well, thank you again. I am going to thank sign off for from Facebook Live. And um, bye, everyone. Thank you for for coming. Thank you, everyone. And I will have everyone else log out. I will.